my first job in life was at Farnborough, working on Concord, and the the top en engineer there was very good. So we were lucky enough because of him to have a successful time. But it it I was sitting in a in my office, which was beautiful. It was an old golf course overlooking the runway at Farnborough, and thinking, have I stuck with this for the rest of my life? And the phone rang, and it's Bruce McLaren. I thought, wow. And he said, uh, I, I, I hear you're interested in motor racing. I said, yeah. He said, would you like be interested in designing my first F1 car? I thought this is some wind-up. But I thought, well, maybe it's not. You never know. Um, so I said, well, yes. Uh, he said, well, then, would you care to come and join us for dinner tonight? I didn't know it was Teddy and Bruce. And they offered me a job. I know Bruce uh, said over dinner, well, look, if you join us, there'll be 12 of us all together, but uh, six of us are going off to do the Tasman series. So there'll be you, we've got a good draftsman called Eddie State, two good mechanics called Ray Rowe and Colin Beanland, a good ma machinist called Alan State, uh, and of course Ian Young, and we leave you behind, and you can design the first McLaren Formula One car. And it was one of those things, you know, will you do it? You know it, the, the consequence is going to be significant either way. And um, if you say no, uh, you know, you lose an opportunity. Yeah. If you say yes, it could be the biggest cock up of all time. Uh, and I, I knew I had about two seconds to make a decision, and I decided, yeah, I'll do it. It was a wooden shed, literally a wooden shed, on the Felton Trading Estate. There were altogether 12 people there. Six doing the Tasman series, six of us left behind. Was it was, without doubt, the best group of people, most capable and the greatest group of people I've ever met in in my life in motor racing. They all played a massive part in in the design. Uh, I mean, I think I tended to get the credit, but I always felt it was important, even if it was a tea lady, to get as many ideas as you possibly could, and they all did. I mean. Tyler, Bruce, of course, Teddy, they all they all contributed. It was it was very much a team, and I've never met such a team like that before. Yeah, when when I had came to actually start building the car or designing the car, I mean, I'd spent two years, three years, totally in, involved, obsessed by aerodynamics, and I was lucky because I was an aerodynamicist, and it was all based around the aerodynamics. Also, little bits uh, from the structural part. I mean, the the we had a, a, a honeycomb structure and stuff like that, and the bonded together rather than riveted, and the the that formed the fuel tanks with no rubber tanks and stuff like that, and it was very rigid and uh, and light. After the first run, my my salary was doubled <laughs> by Teddy that evening. It, it, it worked fine. And everything looked great. I mean, the, the M2A1 seemed to go okay. And uh, M2B1 was a lot more elegant. The most, I, I perpetrated what's got to be the most stupid decision ever in motor racing because testing the M2A1, uh, that because I was obsessed by the aerodynamics, I thought, well, why don't you put a wing on the car? And everybody was on the single seater people, this hadn't been done before, not to any sense would agree. And of course, all the lads took the piss out of it. You know, Robin, we, we race on the ground, not in the air, you know, blah, blah, blah. But eventually they, they agreed to do it with a, a lot of mirth and humour. And, uh, and Bruce was all for this. And uh, I said to Bruce, look, it's probably to do the test fairly. And we did it right at the end of the test at Zanvoort, this was. Uh, it's probably best I don't show you any lap times and he agreed. Just tell me what it felt. And we did it and the first lap was three seconds faster than without the wing. Uh, and the second, and it repeated, then we took it off and the three seconds, we did it three seconds faster. But there were a few journalists around, so we thought we'd better not give the game away. And we made a, 
a display of carving up the wing and putting in the, in the bin, stuff like that. But we thought, look, you know, we're going to have a great first few races. Monaco is important for aerodynamics. The people tend not to realise this. Its downforce is important. And uh, if I put the, the wings on the car at Monaco, I mean, I don't think we'd have been necessarily been on pole position. And I don't think it would have been a three-second gain. But it would certainly put us right up near the front. Why did I not do this? And it was just, you know, the answer is, I know the answer, there's absolute stupidity. But we could have done a decent, you know, decent start. My mistake. So the 1966 season was very disappointing. But the team was absolutely determined to eventually do a good job. And 67 was quite a remarkable year. The, the first point, we, was Can-Am was a big deal in those days. And uh, Bruce had had a modified Cooper Monaco beforehand. And he asked me, designer, a Can-Am car, which was great because the opportunity to uh, make aerodynamic gains was great. And the, I'm not sure if it was done before that, but essentially what I did was to make the front of the car a ground effect car, a, you know, to create downforce under the car. He put a, a pitot tube underneath the car and an anemometer and Bruce sat me in the passenger seat and, you know, he could see what the needle was going to do. It, there's a, you start off and you go into a pretty fast right-hander and uh, Bruce was very anxious to see what the anemometer meeting did going in there and it went like that. Uh, you know, it was a low pressure. And Bruce got so excited. I thought, Bruce, come on, you're going to crash it. Uh, but obviously it gave a lot of downforce. We went around. And then he went very quiet. And I thought, Bruce, why have you gone quiet? And he said, well, Robin, no one else must ever know about this. Because if this gets out, it's, I mean, this is going to give us a big advantage on this car forever, which it did balanced it out and the car was very good it, it absolutely dominated the Can-Am series and um, uh, yeah it was great it was the, the beginnings of the success, the real success of the McLaren operation so much so that Keith Duckworth at that time and I was only 26 I think um, the, uh, Keith Duckworth came along to me and said that he was he built the phenomenally successful DFV, obviously. And Keith was a great guy. He said, look, Robin, would you design the Cosworth Formula One car for me? And I said, well, I can't do this, Keith, because I'm with Bruce. Bruce has given me my first, first chance to go to be a designer. He said, but the, the DFV was, was as dominant dominant in Formula One, as the McLaren was as dominant in Can-Am. And uh, it was put to me that maybe if McLaren, if I came to Cosworth, maybe the, the DFV might go to McLaren's and it would be a swap. But one of the conditions was that uh, I'd be allowed to stay at McLaren's to complete the M7 uh, and to see it run in the first two races and stuff like that. And it came second in the World Championship. That was 68. And that was really the first, the beginning of McLaren's. Uh, and funny, 50, sorry, 20 years to the day, 88, McLaren won 15 out of 16 races in Formula 1. Should have been all 16. So the lads done good after I left.